Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. This is the second in a series of four lectures about Buddhist arts of ministry being sponsored by the Divinity School. And this is actually part of a class that is going for the whole year in which we're looking at the way that contemporary uh, Buddhist ministers are teaching and thinking and talking and acting in uh, a variety of contexts in the Buddhist world and also in general in the American religious world. So I'm very happy to introduce our second speaker, John Rockwell, who is here from Vermont. Uh, he's still moving in from Vermont. <laughs> Tell the country you can <laughs> <laughs> he teaches at Karma Choling and also other places around the world. He is part of the organization now known as Shambhala, which is the very large Buddhist uh, community and organization originally established by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who was a Tibetan teacher in the 19 whatever they were, the 70s. 70s, 80s. Yeah. And, uh, and John Rockwell himself is a long-term student and teacher of Buddhism. He was educated at uh, Naropa University and taught there for a very long time and now is based primarily in Vermont and teaches meditation and teaches a variety of other things and is one of the head acharyas uh, which is uh, we were actually talking about what the status exactly was it's called Asha Ashe Acharya yeah but, but Ashe Ashe, Ashe uh, which is a uber sort of title of, of the Acharya in the, in the oh, that's nice this uber is, Acharya uh, Shambhala is one of their flourishing and also extremely creative and interesting Buddhist communities in the US and, and the world and we're very honored to uh, here, John Rockwell, all this evening, who is going to address you on some of the topics I think dears to his heart that somehow respond to what it is that we're doing here. So I'm very glad to see you. I, I just told him that I was going to tell a Trumpa story, and it's kind of the moment has passed, but it's only just to let you know that the great, wonderful teacher Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche had a habit of always arriving very late at lectures, and we just experienced about two minutes of it in which what the audience would do at a certain moment was to become silent and there would be some kind of combination of being extremely irritated like you know where the hell is the teacher but also recognizing that this was kind of a teaching experience or a learning experience for them as they waited patiently for him he often would show up like an hour or two late and then immediately and come in and immediately captivate the entire audience and make them forget how irritated they were. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's, so we, we all experienced that for a moment, even if you didn't notice it. Um, but anyway, that's what happened. <laughs> so John Rock, Rockwell, thanks very much for coming. Thank you, John. I'm delighted to be here tonight. I'm not quite sure where I am, but it's good to be with people and to talk about uh, the Buddhist path. In particular, I'd like to talk about emotions tonight because uh, really the whole path is about how to work with emotions. If you think about why anyone would become a little bit fuzzy, is that? Why one would be interested in Buddhism, the, um, usually people have some kind of emotional difficulty or for that matter, emotional inspiration. It's not purely a neutral um, curiosity or inquisitiveness. And in fact, the Buddha, you could say, became interested in Buddhism because he had emotional problems too. And he had a lot of questions, particularly about why people suffer 
and what is the meaning of life and who he was and how he could benefit others. So he had to leave his situation which was an emotional event, leaving his family and uh, spent many years seeking, trying to understand what the mind is. Oh, I'm about to get a new transmission. So at some point I some point I might start stalking around the world as I've always seen Christian ministers do and wanted to emulate. <laughs> Coming from a sitting tradition, most of us are used to sitting in chairs, uh, sort of usually on a meditation cushion when we give talks. Can you hear okay? Okay. The word emotion really means to move out, to be moved outward. But the earlier word that uh, was used for emotions was the passions. And, uh, all of the emotions were called the passions, which is kind of an interesting word, because the root of the word passion means to suffer. So mostly when we talk about uh, working with emotions, there's a feeling of um, uncertainty and difficulty, particularly with certain emotions. Many of us are very good with uh, joy or happiness or passion even, although you can get in trouble with credit cards and passion. But aggression, most people find very difficult to work with. And one Buddhist teacher said jealousy is definitely um, gives you no satisfaction whatsoever as an emotion. And pride gives you a lot of emotion, but nobody else, excuse me, gives you a lot of satisfaction, but nobody else feels satisfied being around someone who's full of pride. So in the Buddhist tradition, there's a basic uh, problem with uh, suffering, of being confused about how to work with energy, how to work with communication, how to work with um, emotional um, energy. And it seems that many of us come to the Buddhist path thinking that uh, meditation will calm us down and make uh, emotions manageable or workable, or maybe they'll just go away and we'll have this smug little smile on our face like the Buddha who attained nirvana, the cessation, and particularly of confusion. But of course, um, emotions don't go away. Emotions are like the body, um, or any kind of energy we have. We can't actually get rid of them. The Buddha tried, actually. He tried the kind of meditation that was very uh, current in India at the time, which was really a kind of world-denying uh, meditation where you try to focus the mind out of existence. You can focus the mind more and more and more into a more and more subtle uh, clarity and power and can leave the body and can leave almost any kind of experience. It's a little bit like what some of us experienced on drugs and yet we came down much quicker Whereas the Buddha could stay up there quite a while and yet found that sooner or later you have to come down. You have to come back to having a body, to being in this world, to having a family, and um, being in a world of friends and enemies as well. The Buddha did have enemies, people who did not wish him well and who attacked him. So he had to deal with aggression coming towards him. And he obviously had aggression himself uh, on his path. So in our tradition, when they talk about suffering, we're really talking about an inability to um, uh, work with a body and emotions, and in particular, mind. 
but it all centers around the mind. And yet, it's not mind in abstract, in abstraction from having a body. And in fact, uh, we can't find mind without a body. So meditation is the uh, key discipline for looking at what is the cause of suffering. What is an emotion? What is confusion? So the path is really one of understanding rather than trying to achieve a certain state of mind where we could be free of emotions or we could be in control of emotions. I think one of the the um, most inspiring things for me in meeting Trimpa Rinpoche was to find a teacher who was supposedly the enlightened, who had emotions, and he had lots of emotions. He had an incredible sense of humor. He would laugh at the crudest joke, as well as the most sophisticated joke. He um, cried torrents of tears when the head of his lineage. Uh, died in public, was not ashamed to cry in public. And um, his uh, wife just recently released a biography of their life together. And she talks about when they were having difficulty in their marriage, they would sometimes close the door and start throwing everything at the room at each other, kind of breaking everything just to have an all out, no holds barred uh, kind of fight and she said afterward there was no there was no shadow or no kind of uh, after effect they just kind of blazed like a fire and let go and that's often what it was like to be so we're talking about how to have authentic communications how to be truly angry how to be angry in a way that's communicative and that's genuine and heartfelt and actually is helpful and is benefit And I think that's what we're all looking for, is how to love properly, but also how to be angry properly, how to, uh, in some sense, be jealous properly, which might inspire us to uh, attain uh, higher um, achievements. And sometimes in the Buddhist path, they'll talk about practitioners competing in the signs of realization. So how to bring emotions to the path or to our life is really at the heart of this path and part of uh, being a human being altogether. I don't think if you met somebody without emotions, I don't think we would consider them alive, really. And I have met people like that who were Buddhist pr- practitioners, and I wondered if they were um, alive. But I, it was just a temporary hypnotic state I'm convinced they were in. So even on the Buddhist path, you can get waylaid by meditation practice. To really understand emotions, though, you have to understand uh, the kind of root of all emotions, which in the Buddhist tradition, when they talk about the uh, cause of suffering, what is the, who's the culprit? What's the traditional answer? Anybody? Pardon me? Clinging, okay. That's one, ignorance, okay, one, two, there we go, one, two, punch. So clinging or fixation, and then the considered to be the deeper root is ignorance itself. Now, ignorance is a funny word in our tradition. It sounds like we're stupid and just don't know something, which in a sense is true. Yet the tradition often defines uh, ignorance as not so much a lack of knowing, but more of a um, fixated knowing, or you could say a hyper-knowing that rather than the mind being stupid, it's, it's more of intelligence gone wild and um, sort of creating things that aren't there. So if you think about what's at the heart of emotions, emotions are all based on some kind of relationship to other people. It's very hard to have an emotion in space. It's usually got to be about somebody or about ourselves at the very least. Uh, And usually there's a storyline with it, and there's some kind of uh, energy and judgment, and uh, we can get very uh, fixed in them. So they have a 
uh, life unto their, um, themselves. And in fact, many of us feel ruled by certain emotions where they take over our life. So that's where the clinging comes in as well. There's some kind of stuckness or fixed quality to emotions. So oftentimes the first way you deal with emotions is by um, refraining from being uh, caught in the momentum of them. And this is what meditation practice does, you could say. It's a emotion break. Because you go in and you sit on a cushion and um, you can stop your body from doing something emotional and you can stop your voice from doing something emotional, but the mind just keeps cranking on. And so you find yourself having an emotional entanglement with everybody in the room, even people you've never met before. You immediately dislike somebody and start thinking about them and creating some kind of storyline. And you see people you do like, and that's even more interesting in terms of fantasy life. And when we do long meditation practices, people, you know, have love affairs, uh, have fights, have children, get divorced and, you know, murder each other in the room and nobody moves a muscle. So the notion of meditation practice is it lays bare our emotional life so we start to see it, and yet it's considered to be a, a first step of renunciation, of cutting the, the kind of fixation we have in emotional uh, patterns and developing understanding of where we get stuck and uh, how we manifest that, how we think about it, how we feel about it, uh, what tends to start it, what kind of, uh, usually there's some kind of spark, and then a storyline, and it's very repetitive and with endless variations, just like uh, any reruns. So that's considered the first step, and that gradually you learn to stop that, to learn what your habitual patterns are, and then begin to be aware of when those patterns start to emerge in your daily life such that you can say, I'm not going there this time, even though the mind will still crank out. I'm not going to say that thing. I'm not going to do that thing that always just sets them off or drives them crazy. So that's considered a kind of beginner's approach to emotions. And they say that um, if you're in a situation that's very, very difficult, that uh, the best thing, you know, the kind of mm, most basic strategy is just be a block of wood, meaning don't respond. So this is kind of uh, how you bring the meditation practice to your daily life, which is not very helpful in a relationship of the person you're communicating with and trying to have a good fight with turns into a block of wood. That's even more provoking. So this is more of a kind of refuge of last resort and only as a temporary um, stay, because sooner or later you have to say something, you have to do something. All of us have to respond and engage. Engage if we're in the middle of a fight, or in the middle of um, saying I love you to someone. You can't just go silent if someone says I love you. You have to say something back, or I guess even silence then becomes a way of communicating But in the Buddhist tradition, underlying every emotional fixation is ignorance. And it's important to understand what ignorance means and to translate it into a word that we're maybe more familiar with in our ordinary language. Trungpa Rinpoche defined it more as fear. It's basically uh, ignorance is a kind of an anxiety or panic attack. And it comes out of um, feeling of not knowing who you are, and moreover, um, not knowing who the other person is, too. So we go through this all the time when we meet people, and even somebody we know, we're always looking to see um, how they are. Are they angry? Do they remember what I said or did? Are they uh, friendly? Or do they remember who I am? And many ways, um, because we don't really know fundamentally who we are, uh, the only way we can begin to piece it together who we are is to look at other people. It's a very interesting way the mind works, that the mind builds up a case for who I am by looking at other people 
and trying to define our relationship to them. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience. We experience it all the time in our meditation ex- center where you're walking down the hallway, somebody's coming towards you, and you're not sure who it is yet, but and it causes a kind of panic where your mind immediately wakes up and uh, because, you know, you're just minding your own business, thinking about whatever you're thinking about and uh, happily enjoying the world, and suddenly there's another being in the world coming towards you. And for most of us, if you actually look at that, that's a kind of threatening experience because there's a moment of uncertainty of who are they and who am I and what's my relationship to them and what's their relationship to me. And if we don't know that, the mind will go into a kind of high gear to try and figure that out. So you can watch your mind as you see, and particularly if you're someone like me and you're in a place where there are a lot of people who are constantly coming through, oftentimes you can't remember the person's name and then the mind really goes into high gear and tries to think who is that person who is that person where did I meet them Um, what do they know about me Um, do they know who I am (laughs) so this is the spark of what we would call in our tradition ignorance not knowing who we are not knowing who the other person is and that uncertainty causes the mind to go a bit wild and to start creating things and try to find some kind of um, reference point for um, who they are and who we are together. And your mind can go through many, many scenarios as they get closer. First you think they look friendly, then you think they look upset, then you're not sure. And so then you think, well, I will be friendly to them, but no, I won't be friendly to them, and then I'll just ignore them and walk right past. So this is the beginning of what we call passion, aggression, and delusion. You either try to pull them forward and make friends with them, or you push them away and attack them, or you just ignore them. But it's all based on a anxiety of uncertainty of not knowing. Now I'm sure many people are saying, I know who I am, and you could pull out your wallet and you have identifications of all kind, but that's proof that we don't know who we are. If you are asked who you are, what would you say? Most of us would uh, say our name first as if that's something very satisfying and clever and means something about who we are. But actually, name doesn't really say very much. So then we could say our profession, and that sort of says what we do. But are we just our profession? No, we're not. The Buddha, when he was asked who he is, he just said, I'm a Buddha. And most people said, that's nice. What's a, what's a Buddha? So he said, which means I'm awake. So most of us don't try that when we're asked, who are we? We don't say, I'm awake. Or I'm breathing. I'm alive. I'm a human being. So those might get closer to who we are, but fundamentally we can't quite put our finger on it And we also can't quite put our finger on who other people are. We say certain people are a friend or a lover, but by the end of the day, they're our enemy and our antagonist. And where somebody starts out the day our enemy, and, you know, lo and behold, they become our friend in a year or so. So it's hard to pinpoint who people are. And in fact, that's that's where emotions have such a powerful uh, role to play in our world of, How do you communicate when you're not sure who you are and you're not sure who they are? How can you have authentic communication where you say, I love you, that it actually has meaning for us? So the role of meditation practice is to begin to train ourselves to look at mental states more closely. 
because the only way you'll find out what emotions are and who we are is to look more closely at our body and uh, our kind of energetic feel and then what goes through our mind. And the we might study a lot of different things about what body is and what energy is, what it is to be alive, to breathe and to eat and drink and sleep and so forth and what it is to have a mind and what it is to have thoughts. But in this tradition, you leave all that behind. It doesn't particularly matter um, what you've seen of how the eye works and how the brain's supposed to work. What we're interested in is what's the experience? What's the direct experience? And you can't say the brain is a direct experience. Whereas we do have direct experience of thoughts and emotions and feelings of all kinds. And so that's the real grist for the mill in this path, is looking directly at experience. And that's all meditation practice is. And of course, then it extends to life 24 hours a day. There's no end of things happening, even in the middle of the night when you wake up and you realize what you've been dreaming, or for that matter, having a lucid dream and seeing what a dream's like. That's a very interesting state. And supposedly, um, you could even examine what it's like to be in dreamless sleep. It's considered to be the most subtle state of all, a kind of death-like state. And in the Buddhist traditions, they say you can even look at, examine death itself. Death is just another state of um, being that we go through. Um, and in fact, it's uh, something we go through all the time of things constantly falling apart. And there's a gap where um, one moment gave birth to some emotion, the next moment that dies, and you have a momentary experience of that, death of that, or death of a relationship, or a death of um, uh, a uh, re- um, family member. So interestingly enough, in our tradition, when we talk about when you really get into the nitty-gritty of working with re- uh, emotions, the idea is that emotions become more vivid, more um, direct, more energetic. The thing that's so terrifying about emotions is that um, feeling of losing control, losing a sense of who we are, even falling in love, which is you know something we all yearn to do, and it actually happens, and you feel like you've lost your heart and mind and body and soul totally to another human being, then you realize they, they have you. And that's a wonderful feeling and a totally terrifying feeling at the same time. And in fact, they leave the room and you start to get queasy, wondering if they'll come back with your soul and mind and heart. And what if they leave you in this state of helplessness? And that's where jealousy and uh, possessiveness comes into play. You can't let that person out of your sight because they have you. And the same with anger, which is even more terrifying when we lose our temper and are in danger of actually injuring ourselves or someone else. That's a very terrifying moment of feeling like an emotion is engulfing us. And so that's why we're, most of us avoid anger tremendously and um, have learned to squelch that. We don't know how to fight properly. We don't know how to disagree or emotionally uh, say, I don't like you and I don't like what you did. You know, that creates an incredible amount of tension and fear in us because, again, our ground is uncertain. We're not sure who we are and we're not sure how to express what we're feeling and we're not sure how the other person's going to respond. And yet that is the world of emotions and from the Buddhist point of view, emotions actually are what we would say transmissional. They actually teach us how things are. When we start to lose our ground through experiencing some kind of emotion, that's considered a teaching of how things really are. So rather than we're losing control, it's like we never had control in the first place. And yet, um, it's not particularly like we're out of control either because we're not sure who we are to lose control. What would it mean if we lost control? Most of us imagine some kind of demon will come out, but 
we also don't believe we're the demon, so we're not sure if there is a demon in us. And that's again what meditation practice is about. See if we could find the demon in our mind. See if we could find the angel in our mind. Is there such a thing? You certainly will find a lot of thoughts, and you will find a lot of feelings, and you will feel and find a lot of emotions, and you'll also find a lot of just random static. The mind is a very jumpy and very uh, subtle and very complex experience where one moment you're furious at the next p person and the next you're wondering where they got that lipstick from and then you're wondering what's for dinner and then you remember to be furious again at them and trying to think of something and then your mind just goes blank for a while and then you wonder what that color is and then you remember why you are furious at them and start to argue with them and then you look at them and you suddenly realize you love them and all in the matter of three minutes so the mind can do that it can go through a full spectrum of emotions thoughts just uh, blips of um, sometimes even incomplete experience just like little um, bubbles So the one thing that's common to all of these that comes from this uh, mind of fear is that what tends to happen when the mind is fearful and it speeds up and it's looking for some kind of reference point is that the mind contracts, or what we call freezes. But it's almost like it just becomes smaller. And um, this is what we call a uh, confused mind. It's a small mind. It's a mind where we just latch on to something and hold on tightly as if that's what's real. And therefore we start to try and push away all other experiences. It's a little bit like, this is a practice we do all the time actually. It's, it's really how you can enjoy many experiences is that you come here in fact and you ignore all the other things that are going on in your mind or in this room, maybe not completely, and just listen to my voice and look at me. And that's, that's one way of um, sort of having a coherent experience that this is a talk. I don't know if it's coherent or not, but... Or more commonly, um, because you do think I'm real, more commonly we go into a movie theater and we ignore the fact that we're in a dark room with a bunch of other people in these chairs looking at a white screen illuminated by quickly flashing images and we take it as real within a matter of seconds usually even before that even when they just have the um, advertisements on we're already just sucked in and that's that's how the mind works that's the uh, what I'm talking about when I say the uh, intelligence gone wild we can create things that aren't real instantly and we can um, take a world like a movie and experience joy and uh, fear and love and uh, anger in a matter of two hours and then get up as if it was the most ordinary experience in the world. And that's actually what we do in meditation practice too because meditation practice is very boring and really we don't know what meditation practice is. We're, we're given an instruction and we go in there and we say, I'm meditating, just follow the breath I'm meditating. Boy, this is stupid. <laughs> but it's something supposed to happen. I'm supposed to feel calmer. I'm meditating. I'm following the breath. Well, ten minutes go by. You know, another movie. So, comedy. One we've seen before. Think, well, I could do better next time. Follow the breath for 20 seconds. Then, tragedy. Tragedy usually lasts for a couple of hours. <laughs> or at least until the person hits the gong and then then it's to be continued after the walking meditation and sure enough you come back and you can pick up instantly where you were so we live in a, a world of emotions we create emotions all the time if if we don't have something we will create something that we will get angry or sad or uh, feel love towards it's very easy to do and this is the power of the mind and also how the mind confuses itself. It's so interesting how we create something that's not real but then get sucked into the fact 
or we lose track of the fact that we created it and we think it's real and then we feel like it's going to control us. So that's the funny thing about emotions is that we in some sense give rise to them but then we feel haunted and hounded and overwhelmed by the energy that we've put out. We don't recognize it's our child and in fact the child starts to run the show. So the whole point here is to actually um, see how we create uh, false emotions, kind of emotions out of nothing, and then to start to look at what a genuine emotion is. And a genuine emotion um, is very easy because it arises naturally. It arises when we're in a space where we're not fearful and we're willing to face whatever arises and not cling to it as any kind of ultimate experience but also to experience it completely so when we feel upset at somebody and you know when you do meditation practice it becomes harder and harder hopefully to ignore the fact that you're upset and so you realize that you have no choice but to face the fact that you're upset and then not particularly blame it on another person but to at some point express it first of all to express it to yourself what's going on and then at some point to say you know interesting thing I'm feeling this anger towards what you did what you said and this is uh, really how relationships thrive because even if uh, fundamentally you don't buy it completely and they don't buy it completely it still can taint a relationship if it's not exposed and the thing where emotions become deadly is if they're kept in a small world a small mind and that's what we do when we suppress emotions or for that matter act them out is that we have a mind that's fixed and um, yet when you bring emotions out in a more larger space where it's almost like saying this isn't particularly mine and it's not yours but Anyway, there's this interesting uh, emotion that arose and it's, it seems to be happening between us somewhere and it seems to happen when you're around, particularly when you do that thing and it seems to come, you know, it starts in my body right about here this little knot starts and then the heat comes up to about here and then before I know it, I want to say something harmful to you and blame you for how I feel. Sound familiar? And uh, so this is kind of um, group meditation practice where in a relationship it's very hard, particularly when you live with somebody for a long time, it's very hard to tell, did this thought arise in my mind or your mind first? I think it was your mind first and you injected that anger into me. I was fine, I was feeling very happy, and you came along and you injected that anger in me, and now I'm upset. So take it back. And the other person says, Hey, you think I was angry, but actually, I just had an upset stomach. And, uh, you know, this is totally your create. Anyway, back and forth it goes. And that's again the fear. The fear is again, who's, who's, whose emotion is it? Who's responsible for it? Who's stuck with it? Who's a bad person because they felt anger? Who's a good person because they felt love? So we're still trying to create ourselves. That's what most of our energy goes in the world, is trying to create ourselves and then defend that or extend that. And we think that's going to give us some kind of security and some kind of control and some ability for having good relationships and a good job and a good family and so forth. But in this tradition, the most basic truth is that we don't know, that the ground is uncertain, that who we are is not fixed and who the other person is not fixed, and that to acknowledge that without fear or to acknowledge that we do feel fear is the ground of any kind of healthy relationship because fear is not just um, stupid fear has a lot of um, intelligence to it as well you know when people are afraid 
they generally get better posture and they tend to look a little more closely at what's going on and they tend not to be so um, believing in what people say but look at how they are acting, how their posture is, how the whole situation is and to look around, make sure there's nobody sneaking up from behind. So that's the kind of mind we bring to meditation practice. You could say that meditation itself is a kind of uh, exercise in facing fear and realizing that we don't know and it kind of freaks us out. We don't know what the answer to life is. We don't know who we are ultimately and we're willing to face that uncertainty and just see what arises when we uh, face that. And so that's the beginning also in a creative relationship is um, to acknowledge that fundamentally I don't know who you are, but I am attracted to you. And I also don't like that thing you do. And I'm jealous of this and I'm appreciative of that. And the whole thing comes along and it's kind of uh, what we would call in the um, Vajrayana or Tantric tradition, we would call it the mandala of our um, world. Particularly in the um, notion of mandalas, that your whole world is included, which means all the emotions are included. In fact, they have to be included because emotions, when they're freed up from this kind of fixed um, struggle of trying to make them solid or into some kind of reference point, emotions become wisdom. So the basic uh, emotion of fear, you could say, or fixation becomes the uh, wisdom of space, that you're willing to just accommodate whatever comes up. Or you could say that it's a kind of bravery, which doesn't mean you don't experience fear, but that you're willing to face fear. That's what we call meditation practice. That's why most people don't meditate, frankly. It's kind of a terrifying experience to um, go in and just face your mind. In fact, that's why we meditate in groups so that people can't run out of the room easily. It's kind of a mutual, I won't chicken out if you won't chicken out pact. It also makes you feel less ridiculous for just sitting there doing nothing. Because you can see, say, well, see, other people are meditating too. Maybe they know what it is. But the mandala principle is that's the center, is the basic bravery and accommodation or space. And then the east in front of you is the uh, emotion of anger. And anger, of course, is um, usually based on somebody knowing what's wrong with the world. And people who are really angry know what's right and how things should be. And they can tell you very clearly how things are, should be, and why they're not right. And so when that's freed up, that kind of intelligence is what we call the mirror-like wisdom which is the ability of the mind just to reflect accurately what's there. It's the sharp clarity of mind. And you need that in a relationship. And then in the south, which is in this case uh, to your right, is the emotion of pride. And pride, of course, is usually a sense of um, I'm better than everyone else, which is really an expression of poverty that we try to build. Our, we feel so inadequate and so fearful that we try to build ourselves up and give us a fortress from which to um, feel secure from. So when you actually let go of that, then it becomes what they call the wisdom of equanimity, which is a f feeling of self-existing richness in the world. It's, none of these wisdoms are about your mind. It's about more the, the mind and its relationship to the world altogether. Wisdom is never my wisdom versus the rest of the world's um, stupidity. It's a wisdom that you realize exists in everyone. So, and so on and so forth. So, all of the emotions are included in this principle. So, traditionally, um, you know, in the terms of the Four Noble Truths, there's the suffering, which is what we're talking about, this fear of ignorance and the fixation or clinging that it leads to and the struggle with emotions. Um, then there's the cause of it, which we, as we just talked about, is this fixation and fear. The cessation is when you actually understand there is no, nothing to cling to fundamentally, and there is nothing fundamentally to be afraid of. 
although relatively there are quite a few things you should be afraid of so you should discriminate and rather than there being cessation of emotions it's more of cessation of fear and cessation of fixation so that actually emotions become a um, experience of uh, joy or of uh, a manifestation of freedom that to be able to say to someone I love you or I'm angry can actually bring benefit can actually liberate where we get stuck in a, uh, relationships and with ourselves and um, so that's one of the things I did feel I learned a lot from this tradition which was it's not just learning how to love properly but it's learning how to fight properly and I learned that very quickly in my marriage too that the marriage would not survive if we didn't learn how to fight in a way where there are no low blows and yet you can kind of let loose how you feel and and openly share that and yet still not lose uh, not be caught in a small mind and um, not get caught in um, fixating on the other person is bad for whatever they have to say or yourself is bad for whatever you have to say so from that point of view the path becomes very dynamic and in our tradition uh, as we've been taught there's no religious path per se it's not anything different from our world of work and family and jobs and if you think monasticism is a quiet peaceful um, meditative life you should visit a monastery sometimes it's a hot house of emotions and in fact that's why many people go there is that uh, it's it's kind of um, a very intense way to have uh, relationships with a large number of people and it's the same at the uh, meditation center at which I live which is not a monastic center um, but there are more karmic hits per day than possible so you can be furious at somebody in the day and be bad-mouthing them an hour later and then you open the door and there they are and then of course they're sitting right behind you in the meditation room two hours later or they you know happen to be two people in front of you in the uh, uh, dinner line and of course then as you're going to bed here they come down the hallway directly towards you so you find that um, you can't hang on to fixation fixed emotions whereas most of us have the luxury of being angry at somebody at work and then going home and stewing over it and developing our arguments and strategies so that the next day we'll be ready for whatever and of course it never happens that way but uh, when you're on a fast loop cycle you discover very quickly that uh, it doesn't work you have to face it whatever it is directly and just sort of have it out with the person and see where it leads I didn't feel inspired to stand up and stalk around but I do feel inspired to ask for any questions or comments so please feel free to ask about anything I've said or anything I haven't said that you're curious about do we have a microphone for people or will they are you recording questions I think we're going to get a microphone, so if you could just hold that thought. What would be the difference between uh, doing this at a meditation center and just going around and doing that all the time, 24 hours a day while you're living? No difference if you can do it. Fundamentally, there's no... The main difference is, um, I guess you would say, the hothouse effect. And when you go to a center, you're in an intentional community of people who say, yes, I will practice meditation I will face my own mind and then I also face yours and that creates a particular kind of um, 
atmosphere that allows for uh, working through difficulties which always come up. That's all it's about is, you know, who's upset with whom and who said what to whom and who did what to whom. It's what it's all about. And so it's the only difference. It can happen in any community, in any family. It's just, this is more like a laboratory. It's a little bit more artificial environment where we try to do a little bit more intentionally. Not that it always works. Thank you, John. And within this world then of emotions, um, can you say something about the Buddhist view of forgiveness, where in your description of that or popping or liberating of emotion, I immediately flashed on an experience of intense anger. It's, I just wanted to murder them. And the next morning, instead, I walked in and I said, I'm sorry and I'd like to make a fresh start. And it was as if I had a 500-pound gorilla off my back. So something... So what were you apologizing for? Oh, my goodness. Years of that self-righteous aspect of anger. You did this, and you did that, and you know I'm right, and you're wrong. So what was the effect on the other person? He said, I, I just was totally nonplussed. He said, I like that. Thank you. He liked that you and took you the blame. To, and you didn't have to apologize. And here I've had these years of building this anger to just, you know, as a weight. So you would so say the relationship... I uh, with forgiveness, so that's right. why I ask it in that way. Why do you say forgiveness? Because it was morally more of like confession. Hmm. It's like well, he, forg- said, he forgave you, is that what you're saying? Well, all I said was, I'm sorry and I'd like to make a fresh start. Right. So uh, to me, that there's a kind of... A right, that's point. what we, as you know, in our tradition called drive all blames into one which is a very tough slogan to work with, but the idea is that if you're stuck in a relationship, somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to take the blame, so to speak, which is really uh, a practical matter of how do you free up. So you just... But of course, it's a tricky slope because some people do take the blame and that becomes a kind of credential for them, which creates another irritation for the other person. So... Apologizing doesn't always work, interestingly enough. It kind of depends. But the um, basic notion of kind of exposing ourself, um, if people feel it comes from the heart, that is generally the key quality there. So sometimes you could just come in and say, you know, this is, um, this is my feeling. And to make it very clear, this is my feeling. It's nothing to do with you but ex- to express it. Sometimes that will work too. Hello. Um, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking when you said cessation, uh, it's about more about cessation of fear. Of course, fear is an emotion. And overall, from your whole talk, talk, the question that comes to my mind is why um, is there something more to enlightenment than just dealing with the emotions? Isn't that too much of a selfish pursuit? Why would it be selfish? Um, well, the way it described it, it seems to me, well, we have all these neuroses that we just have to learn to deal better with or overcome or... So, is there really anything different to enlightenment, anything extra, or is that it, in your definition and understanding? Well, when you see the um, picture of the Buddha, the characteristic, in some sense, is the smile. So, when we talk about emotions in the Buddha sense, we're not just talking about my emotions, we're talking about everyone has emotions and that the liberated form of emotions is what we call love or compassion. And that is all there is. So there are two things you could boil it all down to. 
there's love or compassion on one hand, and then there's what we would call insight or understanding or um, wisdom. So there's a kind of awareness, cognitive insight quality, but there's also some kind of soft heart of warmth and love and tenderness. And those two is the definition of enlightenment. And yes, that is all there is. It's as good as it gets. It's not, uh, it's not the same, but it's not different. Okay. So it's like uh, one of the traditional images says, uh, when the mind becomes fixated, frozen in this kind of, um, who am I? And so therefore just latch onto some mental state. They say it's like water that freezes, just becomes frozen, hard, tough. And that's what suffering feels like. It feels like you're numb, kind of like a block of ice. Or the other image they say is you're like a fire. You're on fire. So the notion here is um, when that energy becomes liberated, it's like the ice melts. And it's still water. It's still emotional energy, but it's not fixated. It's not hard. It's not um, numb. And with fire, it's not like you're being burnt. It's more like you're the sun. And therefore, you know, the whole notion of compassion is not particularly, it's not an emotional state like I feel compassion for somebody who's in pain. It's more that your heart has been liberated so that it radiates in all directions like the sun. And therefore, whether you have to be angry to communicate to your child who's doing something harmful, that can still come from a heart of love. So that, that heart of uh, compassion can express itself in many different ways. And, but it's, it has its roots in that kind of emotional energy, that, but that's just stuck. It's what we call you know, dualistic emotions. I am angry at you, whereas compassion is for everyone, and it's, it's not even owned. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we use that kind of language in the um, in Vajrayana path. We talk about Vajra anger. Vajra means indestructible or diamond-like. And what it's trying to talk about, they're trying to use language in a more poetic way. If you just say anger, then people think, oh, that's neurotic. Whereas if you say, um, you know, wisdom, then it sounds like it has no emotional tone. So they, they try to use two images at once of kind of wisdom anger. And um, so it's possible. Uh, go poof. Okay. Well, you two are in synchronicity there, huh? The worst emotional um, states sometimes have a flip side in these enlightened emotions. And, and in, in some ways, those two are related to each other. In they're flip sides of the same coin. Yeah, that's right. Could you explain that? And, and, and then the part two of that question is, isn't that dangerous? Yes. but uh, unavoidable. So that's why in many ways what we're talking about to remind you where the talk started that the first thing is being the block of wood. The meditation practice is really extracting yourself from the hot house of emotion and you have to study. If you want to be a Buddha, you have to wake up, which means you have to see clearly what's happening in your mind and you have to face it, and that's difficult for most of us because we have this habitual pattern of just creating endless TV shows and movies in our mind and getting lost in them. So to actually be able to acknowledge that and realize how we deceive ourselves and lie to ourselves and um, unknowingly at times because it happens so quick, that takes a lot of training to recognize in more and more subtle ways. On the other hand, none of us can extract ourselves from our life, so we're always 
uh, trying to engage with our relationships and work and uh, life as best we can. And therefore we do get into states of mind. And I suppose the thing that um, we it's mostly sad is that people learn intuitively how far to go. That you can trust yourself, that in your intelligence at, one, at some point will say, stop. Don't say that thing. Which of course doesn't always work. But more and more you can learn to trust yourself. Um, and that fundamentally it's true. They say to... Um, to, to wake up fully means you have to plumb the deepest parts of yourself, which means the place where you're most stuck. And yet most people can't access that for a long time. They don't have the skill or the, the kind of insight or the compassion for themselves to do that. So that's what I meant. There's some kind of safeguard that usually will keep us from going over the edge. Um, yet it's, it's uh, the image is in some ways like a tree that in order for the tree to um, spread its branches higher into the sky, into the space, the roots have to go deeper. And that there's a lot of energy and a lot of intelligence trapped in our emotions. And until we um, learn to tap into it, usually we're exhausted by the end of the day. It's exhausting to suppress emotions or to have emotions that you can't process. So in inability to... Um, Work with our emotions means inability to be available for other people, inability to benefit other people. Most, many people uh, lose their health over certain kind of relationships that are poisonous to them. So this is again the, the Vajrayana image is that the poison has to be uh, transmuted or recognized as um, medicine, which is dangerous. So a little sip at a time. Can you say a little bit about how this actually happens on the cushion? Because I'm, I'm just confused about when, you, when I'm doing a sitting meditation practice, is it um, if I'm aware that there's anger and there's a storyline attached to it, do you sit with it fully or are you um, touching it lightly and sending it on its way? <laughs> if only things were so simple. Okay, I've had enough. Please go. I said, go. <laughs> I've had enough of you. <laughs> um, the basic instruction generally is um, don't fixate, don't push away, but do be aware. So this is what we call the um, giving space or larger mind. So when we fixate, the mind tends to shrink down to the size of that thought or emotion. It's almost like when we watch TV, we ignore the room and our whole mind just shrinks down to the size of the screen and you get sucked into the screen. We do the same thing with our thoughts. So the idea here is keep the big screen, which is uh, very helpful sometimes when you're in a room of people and you're having a very intense emotion to realize it's just an emotion. Other people aren't having this emotion. They don't even know I'm having this emotion. And let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> and therefore, you just let the emotion be. You know, at the beginning, we mainly, because we get so fixated on emotion, there's a lot of training in how to let go. So a lot of the instructions will be just let go because we immediately grab. And so there's a lot, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Let it be. But you can't push it away as much as we would like. And many of us try to, even though we're instructed not to, we try to kill thoughts or emotions just out of sheer boredom or just to see if it would work. And it doesn't. You know, 30 years still doesn't work. But what you do is you learn to, one, live with it, two, get to know it very well, and three, begin to recognize it for what it is. So what is an emotion? We think there's something there. Just like we think... Uh, there's such a thing as a thought. What is a thought? How big is a thought? What's a thought made out of? Why is a thought so powerful? Why when I think of that person, just to have the visual image in my mind, and they're 300 miles away, can my mind just go ballistic? 
So that's, that's actually the heart of the tradition, is to learn what is a thought, what is an emotion, what is it to have a mind and a body. You know, and it's not just theoretical, it's, it's uh, immediate. So you, you know, part of it is sitting there is a very physical experience. It's a bodily experience, just like emotions are bodily. In fact, I read something interestingly where somebody did an experiment where they laid people down and they said, relax every muscle in your body and then try to make yourself angry. And the report was they couldn't do it. You have to tense something. It was very hard to do to create some kind of emotion without tensing the body in some way. To be totally relaxed and spacious in your body made it hard for the mind to tense up. So there's this kind of echo effect that goes back and forth. So I can't remember what your question was, but I'm sure it was there somewhere at the beginning. So say that you're very clear that you're having, it's not while you're meditating, but you're very clear you're having this very powerful emotion. And you're deciding, should I let them know or this person know or not? Yeah, all of us would like to know what's the strategy. So the first strategy is to abandon any strategy because you fundamentally won't know. In our tradition, what they say is all you can do is be on the spot and be open and to look and open your heart. And then something out of the situation will arise, and it may be from your mind, and it may be from the other person's mind, or it might just seem to come out of the space itself. And so the tradition often is learning uh, what we would say how to hold properly, meaning how to be with the emotion, and then how to release, which might be to express it or might be to let it go. And you won't know until you kind of be with it and you won't know until it's on the spot because the whole dynamic of, it's really like asking, how do you know when to tell somebody, I love you? And if you go in with a strategy and some kind of, I'm going to do it at this particular time, just when the moonlight is such and such, then it comes off theatrical and not heartfelt. But usually there's some kind of um, spark or maybe overflowing that happens where it just... But you have to hold that feeling of wanting to say it until somehow the moment's right and then you have to be brave enough to say it on the spot and take a chance. But part of the problem is there are moments when you have this lucid sense of a powerful emotion some at times you really know it's the right and the appropriate motion, it's very clear, but other times there's a question of whether it's self-righteous and actually mistaken, and it's, and it's self-reinforcing, and actually it's not very helpful, and it's deluded. Right. And that's, I think, tricky. To, and, you know, we all know certain people are very good at expressing their emotions all the time, and they're a pain in the butt, and they just go overboard. And, you know, I, I don't think you're saying that we should all just go around and be just, you know, as however emotional, I'm going to just show it, you know. No, precisely opposite. That's why the beginning of the path is renunciation or refraining. That until you study your own mind where you learn quickly how you are self-righteous or how you do tend to emotionally dump on people. I mean, in our tradition, when you practice meditation, one of the first experiences you can often experience is what they call revulsion, which is you get sick, you want to throw up when you see how confused and manipulative and um, stuck your mind is, how it will just go on and on and on and on in ways and how we can project things about other people that just have no basis in reality whatsoever, just to puff ourselves up or just to dump on people. And so that's a um, very humbling in terms of suddenly being excited about going out and sharing your emotions with other people. So it usually brings a kind of meekness of um, starting out more tender way of being a little bit cautious and therefore um, maybe asking them first how they feel. <laughs> but generally, um, 
most of us, if we're honest enough, uh, the feedback is very direct and quick from other people. Most of us, it's like I said, it's mixed um, because we're somewhat confused and awake and they're somewhat confused and awake, so it's hard to know who's doing what to whom, which is why a very important uh, practice in our tradition is to go into solitary retreat. It's very interesting to go into a space in the woods where you're the only mind around. And therefore, everything that happens in there, you have to take responsibility for. It's like walking into a huge echo chamber where everything you say just echoes back to yourself. Whereas when we're in relationships, we say something, and then it seems like something comes from the world back to us, and then we get further upset. But when it's just your own echoing, um, that's um, very helpful. And so retreat practice actually is a great way to train in relationships, interestingly enough, and particularly if both go into separate but equal retreats and then come back. Sometimes that's very powerful, the kind of insights that both people can share. So a lot of developing relationships actually is done in solitude, and that's why, ironically, meditation is uh, fantastic for developing skills for how to be in the world, because it's all about seeing what we bring to the world with our mind. Sounds like a commercial. Um, Is meditation ever not a fantastic practice for someone? What do you mean by fantastic? I don't know, you just used the word, I guess, helpful in terms of understanding your emotions or... um, Meditation is a tool so we can, people can deceive themselves People can puff up with meditation practice and uh, become uh, spiritually holier than thou, tremendously compassionate for all suffering beings. Isn't it terrible? I think I'll meditate on them and send out my rays of compassion to them. So no, meditation can be... Uh, that's why we have what's called sangha or community. And it's also why you have a teacher. So there are three jewels in the Buddhist path. The teacher, whose main role, as Trimpa Rinpoche once said, is to insult you. You think you understand something? Well, I just think you're a pile of shit. How about that? (laughs) So, and the other is the meditation practice, which usually uh, does give you a hard time, too. It's very hard to get your mind to agree in your spiritual ambitions. It's always something that uh, kind of pulls the rug out from you. And then finally, there's the community, which is the other reason we practice in uh, groups and community is that the feedback loop becomes very quick. And the idea of Sangha is that uh, it's much harder for a group deception to kick into gear, although it's possible too, but it's much harder. There's usually somebody in the community who won't buy your trip and who's willing to tell you what they think you're doing, and that's very helpful. So there are a lot of uh, checks and balances on the path, and meditation practice by itself actually can be dangerous because people do create a very high, elevated, pure, very clear states of mind that seems to... I've, I've met people actually who came out of solitary retreat who told me they were enlightened. And uh, I must admit, my first response was, it's funny, you don't seem enlightened. <laughs> How do you know? And they proceeded to me, and some people take, uh, that person in particular, it took six months to a year to come down from that kind of delusional state. I mean, I would agree everybody's enlightened, but are you sure? Yeah. Thank you very much for a really interesting and, and enlightening talk. And there will indeed be two more of these in the spring, and you'll be hearing about them. If some of you who are not from the school itself and aren't sure that you will hear about it again, you can write an email to me by finding my name on the Divinity School website and you can write me an email and I'll be sure that you're on our mailing list or whatever. Okay, thanks again everyone for coming.